and you know the word Catholic means universal. In other words, it must be in universal control of the souls of everyone upon earth. And that is what its missionaries have been going out to do for 2,000 years to make sure that the souls of all people were in universal control of the straight jacket letter of the law interpreters of the Holy Spirit mission of Jesus Christ, which is your mission and my mission also. Whoever challenged that consensus arguing instead for other forms of Christian teachings, was declared to be a heretic and expelled. When the Orthodox gained military support sometime after the Emperor Constantine became Christian in the fourth century, the penalty for heresy escalated. Christian bishops previously victimized by the police now commanded them. Possession of books denounced as heretical was made a criminal offense. Copies of such books were burned and destroyed. But in Upper Egypt, someone, possibly a monk from a nearby monastery of St. Pacomius, took the banned books and hid them from their destruction. In the jar where they remained buried for almost 1,600 years. But those who wrote and circulated these texts did not regard themselves as heretics. Most of the writings use Christian terminology, unmistakably related to a Jewish heritage. Many claim to offer traditions about Jesus that are secret, hidden from the many who constitute what in the second century came to be called the Catholic Church. Traditionally, historians have told us, says Pagels, that the Orthodox objected to Gnostic views for religious and philosophic reasons. Certainly they did. Yet investigation of the newly discovered Gnostic sources suggests another dimension of the controversy. It suggests that these religious debates, questions on the nature of God or of Christ, simultaneously bear social and political implications that are crucial to the development of Christianity as an institutional religion. In simplest terms, ideas which bear implications contrary to that development come to be labeled as heresy. Ideas which implicitly support it become orthodox. Now, during the second century, a variety of Gnostic sects flourished, ranging, for instance, from those encouraging promiscuity to those espousing a strict asceticism. Although their doctrines differed as well, they did share some basic beliefs. What were these teachings that so enraged the early church theologians? As we have said, the Gnostics emphasized gnosis, esoteric knowledge or knowledge of one's true self, as opposed to the orthodox emphasis on faith. As you know, that emphasis continues. If you ask a priest, a minister, or a rabbi why, he tells you it is a mystery, you must accept it on faith. And the truth is, he does not know the mystery either. <laughs> I know this because I spent my teenage and college years going to priests, ministers, and rabbis and asking them questions. And I knew that they had no contact with the inner mystery of which they were the self-appointed guardians. This is akin to the ancient Greek proverb, know thyself inscribed on the temple at Delphi. What they did not inscribe on the temple at Delphi, where it was written, man, know thyself, was the completion of the statement by Jesus given in secret to his disciples when he said, man, know thyself as God. 
Gnostics rejected the need for an ecclesiastical organization with a hierarchical structure to mediate their personal quest for self-knowledge. They dared to challenge the false hierarchy of fallen angels who entered the church to destroy Christ in the sons and daughters of God. They dared to challenge them. Can we do any less? In challenging them, you must be armed with knowledge, and that knowledge is the inner knowledge of oneself as the fruition, the fulfillment of the teaching that you hear, and that is transferred to you by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit dissolves the inability to fully absorb the word. What you receive in the dictations of Jesus and the Masters is the power of his presence and Holy Spirit that comes for the consuming, the purging, the preparing of the chakras, so that in those chakras, in those seven planes of being, you may experience seven planes of gnosis, self-knowledge in God, self-knowledge on the Christed path of the seven rays. This is why we are not a religion that only recites intellectually even the Gnostic teachings. We are a religion that delivers the word of God directly mouth to mouth and heart to heart. And it is a religion of the ascended masters working directly with their disciples. And you know it. And you know that God works directly with you confirming the word. Even when I am not there or any part of that communication, you have it through your Christ self. This is the path into which you are led. The Gnostics believed there was a tradition of outer teachings for the public and esoteric or inner teachings for the elect. According to the scripture I read you this morning from Matthew, Jesus himself confirmed that. So if you wish to look to the Gospels for confirmation of the path of Gnosticism, it can be found abundantly. Gnostics believed in a divine spark in man. Among the Gnostics, says biblical scholar Robert McLaughlin Wilson, the Stoic doctrine that the soul was a spark of the divine fire enclosed in matter was prevalent. They believed that the soul was essentially a fragment of the divine imprisoned in an alien medium from which it sought to gain release. How many espouse that Gnostic teaching? How many of you espouse it? I do. And I'm not afraid to say so. And if they want to put me in a can and seal me up and put a label on it, neo-Gnostic, let them do it. <laughs> Wilson continues, Return to its true abode in the higher regions was secured either by purification from fleshly lusts, by ascetic practices, by regulation of the whole life in accordance with the dictates of the higher element within, or by a magic knowledge of the names of the ruling powers and of the passwords which were the keys to unlock the gates which barred the way or by a mystic vision and enlightenment which raised the fortunate recipient above the limits of human nature and made him a god himself. A regulation of the whole life in accordance with the dictates of the higher element within. Long before you ever came to this church, you were regulating or seeking to regulate your life according to the dictates of the higher element within. Is that not universally true of all here today? Yes. Or by a magic knowledge? Have you ever heard of the magic presence? Have you ever heard of eye magic, the seeing of the all-seeing eye of God? Have you ever heard of alchemy as a magic knowledge a magic knowledge of the names of the ruling powers. It is a magic knowledge because it is, direct, it is given directly by the Holy Spirit. 
who told us the names of Elohim and archangels and ascended masters and the saints in heaven. They came directly by the Holy Spirit. And who has proved to you that these names are real? You have proved it to yourself when you have called upon the Lord, and he has answered you directly in the person of Saint Germain or Mother Mary or Hercules or Archangel Michael. You are proving the law that you are. You are confirming the gnosis. You are not accepting anything upon blind belief. And if you cannot prove it, you have the good sense to lay it aside until God in his good time should either confirm or deny that which you have heard or seen. The passwords which were the keys to unlock the gates. Passwords, what are they? Bija mantras, are they not special syllables and words of God that come down from the ancient of days? Do they not unlock the keys of the petals of the chakras to unfold the flame within? And are they not governed by that cosmic Christ, that only begotten Son of God embodied in Christ Jesus? The gates, passwords to unlock the gates. Where are the gates of the temple? The gates are the seven chakras and the five secret rays. This is what we are talking about, sound, the power of the sound of the word, the specific word of God, whereby we do enter in and know this God inside of us as Gnosis. A mystic vision, enlightenment, which raised the fortunate recipient above the limits. So with the raising of the Kundalini, with transmutation by the violet flame, you are raised beyond the limits of mortality. This is the way of Jesus Christ and all saints. Walk ye in it. The Gnostics' view of Jesus ran the gamut from considering him a good and holy man to claiming him very God of very God. Each in its own level may be considered to be correct. G.R.S. Mead explains that a sharp distinction was made between Christ, the divine eon or perfected man, and Jesus, the personality. The God, or rather God in Christ, did not suffer but appeared to suffer. The lower man, Jesus, alone suffered. This is the lost teaching of Jesus, brought to us by Jesus and by the ascended masters. Each and every one of, this, of us knows that the Son of Man, Jesus, was the evolving Son of God as ourselves, and that the Christ of Jesus is the divine being, the only begotten Son of God, who is that universal one that is the Christ of all of us. That Christ does not suffer, but we suffer in the process of putting on that Christ and divesting ourselves of the things of the lesser vibration. Gnostics taught the concept of the feminine aspect of God. We know that there is confirmation of this from Jesus' own lips that he preached in the East and which were recorded in those Buddhist texts that you find in the lost years of Jesus. The feminine aspect of God is curiously removed from the Orthodox Gospels. One Gnostic group who claimed that they had received through James and Mary Magdalene a secret tradition of Jesus prayed to the Divine Father and Mother whom they addressed as parents of the Divine Being. In the Apocryphon of John, a figure in John's vision tells him that I am the Father, I am the Mother, I am the Son. We are so very familiar with these concepts, not because we have been told from without, but because upon hearing the word, our inner gnosis from previous lives has been quickened. We know from within that when Jesus said to John in the first chapter of Revelation, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, that he spoke of the reality within ourselves of the Father, Mother, God or the divine polarity. So Pagel summarizes these views. Some insisted that the divine is to be considered masculo-feminine, the great male-female power. Others claimed that the terms were meant only as a metaphors, since in reality the divine is neither male nor female. 
A third group suggested that one can describe the primal source in either masculine or feminine terms, depending on which aspect one intends to stress. Proponents of these diverse views agreed that the divine is to be understood in terms of a harmonious, dynamic relationship of opposites, a concept that may be akin to the Eastern view of yin and yang, but remains alien to orthodox, straight-thinking Judaism and Christianity. Now, Pagels herself does not claim to be a neo-Gnostic, and in this discussion, her referring to these views as diverse, I believe to be incorrect. I think every one of these views is true. We are simply talking about different planes of being. In one plane we call Elohim, Alpha and Omega, Purity and Estrella. In another plane, Elohim have merged as the one God in that fiery spherical ovoid, and there is no distinguishment of masculine or feminine. For the purposes of contacting the masculine portion of Elohim or God on a certain ray, we give a certain name because that is the vibration we desire to embody. So these things must be divided according to the cloven tongues of the Holy Spirit. Pagel's study of the Gnostic Gospels has pointed to several similarities to Eastern teachings. While parallel traditions may emerge in different cultures at different times, she writes, and while such ideas could have been developed in both places independently, she brings up the possibility that in the case of the Gospel of Thomas, the influence could have come from India, where tradition says Thomas traveled and preached. Well, she needs to go back a little further to the lost years of Jesus and recognize that Jesus already had brought the Eastern teachings to his disciples and that Thomas had those teachings at the feet of Jesus in Palestine and that he was sent to India by Jesus to continue the bearing of that message of Christ which had begun out of the East and now was returning to the East for the new dispensation to the people. She says what we call Eastern and Western religions and tend to regard as separate streams were not clearly di differentiated 2,000 years ago. Ideas that we associate with Eastern religions emerged in the first century through the Gnostic movement in the West, but they were suppressed and condemned by polemicists like Irenaeus. We also know Jesus himself traveled to the East during the lost years. This we need to understand as a path of discipleship and of putting on this garment of God. Gnosticism is a path of self-realization. Jesus also walked it. That statement is blasphemy to orthodoxy because they want you to believe he was born a flesh and blood God. He was born a flesh and blood God and since you weren't born a flesh and blood God, you could po not possibly ever equate with the path or the mission or the discipleship of Jesus Christ because he was a different sort of being. He was an exception. He was not like the rest of us. So there is no hope for us sinners except to latch on to his coattails. This affirmation of the born flesh and blood God has denied to every Christian since the role of Christ. And this is why Jesus wept. This is why he wept at the end of his mission. The role of the female aspect of God in the creation is explained in a Gnostic text called the Great Announcement. From the power of silence appeared a great power, the mind of the universe which manages all things and is a male. The other, a great intelligence, is a female which produces all things. The Divine Mother is also characterized as wisdom. As such, she brings forth all creatures and enlightens mankind. As you know, this is a parallel to Hinduism, the feminine aspect of God, which is seen as the concept of the Shakti, 
The Shakti is the feminine generative reproductive principle without which the world would not function. Shakti incarnates the divine woman and mother, the mystery of creation and of being of everything that is, that incomprehensibly becomes and dies and is reborn. Everything in matter is the release from the masculine of that energy, person, and presence of Shakti. The Buddhist esoteric tradition of Prajna Paramita, the goddess of transcendent wisdom, is looked upon as productive energy. In exoteric doctrine, Prajna Paramita is known as the mother of all the Buddhas. She is said to confer wisdom upon her devotees. Many Gnostics, writes Pagels, insisted that ignorance, not sin, is what involves a person in suffering. You are not sinners, you are merely not awake. Who said that one? Mark Prophet said that. <laughs> So stop thinking of yourself as a sinner because while you are beset with that self-condemnation, you are turning aside from the real issue. You are ignorant of the law, therefore you cannot become its advocate for the people. You are ignorant of the law, therefore you have not fulfilled its incarnation in you. You have accepted the lie that you cannot be the incarnation of the word. By those have told you for thousands of years you are sinners, and the only one that has ever told you you are a sinner is a fallen angel or one that has been brainwashed by him. It is a doctrine of Satan that tells you you are sinners. And it's high time that you jump to your feet and shake it off. Just jump up and shake off this condemnation and leap in the air. No sin is here. You know, you've heard me many, many years get asked to you, study the pearls, know the teaching, know the word. You don't ever hear me speaking to you, ye sinners. <laughs> but you hear me telling you, you've got to know the teaching because the teaching itself banishes that darkness. That is what is of such concern to me. So let's be seated and hear this. Whoever remains ignorant, a creature of oblivion, cannot experience fulfillment. Remember we have taught you that ignorance is the ignoring of the law. Even if you have heard and known the law, if you ignore its practice, you are ignorant. You are devoid of its presence here, here in your chakras, here in your temples. Do not mistake your intellectual knowledge of the letter of the Ascended Master's teaching for its full expression in you. Remember, I have told you this, you will become just like the Orthodox Christians. You will say, we know the letter, but you have not the example of the inner fire. And then this religion will die just as Jesus' original mission died effectively in Christianity. It is a tremendous responsibility to carry a living teaching, a living word, a living sacred fire. It is all consuming. We have to desire to be devoured by the fire of the teaching and to devour it. We are being devoured by the fire as we are devouring the fire and we cannot rest in sluggishness and forget that it's the daily reinfusion of the whole planet with what you know that counts and the transfer from your heart to people whom you meet. Be mindful whoever you meet, give them a teaching and don't be concerned if they point to you as a fool for Christ. 
be a fool for Christ, but don't withhold the teaching and say, oh, that person cannot accept the teaching. I will be silent. Silence is also ignorance of the law of that Christhood. I found myself sitting in a sauna, in a spa, with one woman who was a Jewish immigrant from Iran. She told me all the woes of her life were, which were based on the sense of loss of her materialistic pleasures and comforts, which she had in Iran and does not have in Los Angeles, and of her children's burdens with the things that young people get into in this generation. I gave her the gnosis of the word, of the defense of what is really worth defending, freedom of the spirit. I gave her the teaching on sugar for her children and how to pray to God to be in her perfect place. I gave all this to her within eight minutes. <laughs> and then I left. I had to initiate the conversation. I struck it up. I was friendly and said, where are you from and so forth. Remember, every moment you are the Christ going after the one lost sheep. Remember this, it is your calling. It is indeed your calling. Do not miss the opportunities.